If you're an ACCU conference regular, you'll have seen little bits of this over the years, in particular one lightning talk and a slightly longer session uh, delivered on the morning after the, the speaker's dinner where I was, where I was monstrously hung over. Um, there's, there's a video of that uh, online somewhere, uh, in which I was um, looking at the CLAC system from the novels of Terry Pratchett and discussing whether they were actually practical or not. I'll be repeating a bit of that. But anyway, let's get started. And the first, the first thing I actually wanted to address is why the hell I got interested in this in the first place. And I got interested in this through a different interest. This is a painting of the scene in Centennial Park in Melbourne on the 20th of August, 1860. And it's the departure of the VEE, the Victorian Exploring Expedition, led by one Robert O'Hara Burke, um, with his sidekick, William Wills, a much younger man who was in charge of navigation. And their task was to try and chart an overland route from Melbourne right up to the north coast of Australia. Um, because Burke was ferociously incompetent, they succeeded but died on the return. Uh, or rather, Burke and Wills died on the return and immediately made themselves heroes. Um, it's kind of very reminiscent of Captain Scott's polar expedition, uh, 50, years pre 50 years later, in that they stuffed it up, and in stuffing it up, they became famous. Um, anyway, they weren't the only people who were trying to chart a route from the south of Australia up to the north coast over land at the time. And in fact, the successful fella was this guy, John McDowell Stewart. He was leaving from Adelaide, though, but he was successful. And this is the route that he, ch that, that he followed. And if you look at a modern map of Australia, you'll discover that the Stuart Highway, which is the highway that runs from Adelaide up to Darwin, pretty much follows his route. And it was also followed. So the question is, why were people so interested in finding a route from either Melbourne or Adelaide up to the north coast of Australia in the 1860s. And the answer to that was the telegraph. Essentially, the telegraph had reached India and was advancing down through uh, uh, what was then uh, Burma and Malaysia and Indonesia. And it was approaching Australia. And it was obvious at some point it was going to get close to connecting Australia to London. Now, this is significant because at the time, of course, if you were a farmer in Australia and you were sending your crop off to, uh, like many of them did, they were sending the wool clip up to London to be sold. Um, the amount of time it took to get an answer to how much money have I got in the bank was immense. And people would pay quite a lot of money to discover that quicker. And why was Melbourne so interested in it? Well, the answer was that the, sailing, the standard sailing ship route um, from London, or Europe generally, was across the Atlantic to Rio, across the other direction, the, the Atlantic in the other direction to the Cape, down the Southern Ocean, and then across, uh, across to, the, uh, to the east, which meant that Adelaide was where everybody touched first which meant all the news went through Adelaide, and that was worth a lot of money to Adelaide. And Melbourne thought, if only they could get the telegraph, the news would all come through then. Wouldn't that be a much better thing if you happened to be in Melbourne? Anyway, you'll notice halfway up here, we have uh, the, town, the considerable town of, of Alice Springs. Now, I, I went to Alice. The last time I was in Alice was ooh, 10 years ago now. I think. And I managed to do something I hadn't done before. This is the spring. And this is the reason that Alice Springs exists. It's a repeater station for the Overland Telegraph. The Overland Telegraph was engineered by, let's move my cursor a bit, this guy, uh, Charles Todd which is the reason that the most of the time dry river through the middle of Alice is called the Todd River, uh, who was a somewhat eccentric person. He used to introduce himself to other people by saying, hello, 
<laughs> My name's Todd. If it wasn't for the tea, I'd be odd. <laughs> so you can imagine just how <laughs> fantastic he'd have been at a party. Um, he got the gig while he was still living... He got the gig as, gig as sort of chief postmaster of South Australia while he was still in the UK. And um, Just before he went, he asked... Um, an old family, the daughter of a family that he'd known for a very long time, um, if, who was at the time 18, if she would marry him and move to South Australia with him in a few weeks' time. Um, meet Alice. Uh, in a consummate piece of brown nosing, uh, Todd Surveyor, who mapped the route out, elected to call the spring Alice Springs after her. Uh, so... Oh, come on. Ah, oh, hello. I know what's happened. I've moved my waving cursor off there. That's better. OK, this is a closer look at the repeater station. Now, you have to remember that this was before the days of mechanical repeaters. A repeater was some poor sod sitting in that shed for 12 hours a day listening to what's coming down the line and then tapping it out on the next line. The major excitement was when the camel train with food and fresh acid for the batteries turned up once every six months. It cannot have been the most fulfilling job ever. The guide that showed me round there, it's a preserved site um, and they have enthusiastic volunteer guides. The guide that showed me round... Um, had just had, he, he just had an operation, which meant he'd had to postpone a holiday over here. And over here, he wanted to go here. Does anybody know where that is? <laughs> Perth Kerno. Why would a person interested in the Telegraph want to go to Perth Kerno? Because that's, that's where all the international lines came in, to a hut at the end of the beach in Perth Kerno. So, story of the Telegraph. Let's go back to the beginning. The first telegraph system, first practical telegraph system in Europe was a mechanical system developed, it was French, it was developed by a gentleman called Claude Chap. And this was at the time of revolutionary France. And it was used as a means to transfer information quickly to and from Paris. Um, when Napoleon took over, he was very enthusiastic about this. Um, and uh, extended it. The, it works by essentially making different shapes with the arms. And you have somebody observing another tower looking at it of a distance. And so uh, by the, um, at the end of uh, the reign of Napoleon, this was the full, uh, you can see there, Le Réseau Chap en France, uh, the Chap network in France. That was the full network. As you can see, it's quite extensive. And the French were very, very much the leaders in mechanical telegraph um, at the time. Britain had a similar but considerably more restricted system. This is the, the British Murray system of 1795, where you had this framework of paddles like this, which would be horizontal or vertical. Um, and yes, uh, the very hungover talk I did was about how this looks remarkably like the clacks in Pratchett, doesn't it? Uh, and here indeed is a contemporary engraving of the High Street in St Albans, and you can see the clacks tower on the top there. Uh, the network was run by the Admiralty. Um, essentially, it went from London to Portsmouth and London to Great Yarmouth. Um, and was limitedly successful. Um, in fact, it turns out that a shutter system like that is very difficult to see at distance. Um, and later in the Napoleonic years, uh, it was replaced by uh, Popham's system, which was a semaphore, uh, over a much shorter range. But essentially, their thing stopped. The Admiralty never let anybody else send messages over it. And actually, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, they just said, hmm, well, we don't really need it anymore. They had various... Once they put these systems up, they had all manner of inventors coming to them, besieging them with ideas for alternative telegraphs. Uh, they did have at least one practi potentially practical electric telegraph, but they were so deluged with crackpots uh, that 
they missed it and they just thought, well, no, Napoleon's gone. We, we just don't need it anymore. Um, there were various attempts around Europe and indeed the rest of the world, at making an electric telegraph, because the advantages were quite, ob were quite obvious. The first one, though, um, the first commercial electric telegraph in the world was this beast. You can see this in the Science Museum. In fact, the Science Museum has got a lovely display of a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. Now, this is, uh, this is the... Um, uh, Cook Wheatstone electric telegraph and after th they eventually persuaded the GWR to install this between Paddington and West Drayton in 1838 it was a five wire system and essentially what happened was you can see the little needles in the middle they would chain you know they would flip that way or that way and point out a letter and that's how you transmit it. Um, it eventually got extended to Slough. Wow. <laughs> so a total distance 30 miles or so. Um, though the extension I think was only a two-wire system. Was only a two -wire system. Now these are, the, these are the gentlemen involved. Um, William Cook uh, was basically a man who wanted to get rich uh, he'd been in the army in India and come home and was trying his hands at one thing or another. And actually, like a lot of success, a lot of the successful people in this business, you had somebody who was who had an idea and knew what they wanted, didn't know how to do it, and had to find a good scientist to help them. And in uh, Cook's case, he found this guy. This fella is Charles Wheatstone. You might have heard the name Wheatstone. We, a lot of us got battered over the head in O-level physics with the Wheatstone Bridge, which is something he didn't actually invent, but he picked out of the obscurity and popularised. Um, he's actually got quite a few pretty solid inventions uh, to his name, um, one of which, the stereoscope was one of them and uh, the Playfair Cipher, which was widely used in the First World War, uh, was another. And, and he did some pretty serious physics and engineering. Now, this was an interesting partnership because essentially Cook wanted to get rich. He wanted to do science and was by turns extremely shy and nervous and incredibly arrogant. Um, so, they got on like a house on fire in the sense of a house actually on fire <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> but they did, they did manage to get this system working um, and to some extent making money, though that wasn't quite as easy as you might have thought. But the five wires, um, you know, it means that their contemporaries on the other side of the Atlantic. This guy is Samuel Morse. And now Morse was the man with the idea who didn't know the physics, who couldn't actually make it himself. Morse was actually an artist. Uh, the reason that Morse got into the idea of the telegraph can probably actually be traced back to the simple fact that his first wife uh, they lived in New Haven in Connecticut, I think. And uh, Morse was, had got a contract for a portrait in Washington, D.C. While he was away, his wife died suddenly. By the time the news got to Washington and Morse had returned post-haste to New Haven, a journey which was then four days, he'd missed the funeral. So Morse worked very hard himself. He also had some fairly um, impressive scientific support. He got a lot of advice from John Henry, the American physicist after whom the unit inductance is named. And also, rather crucially, um, he, had the he had the enthusiasm of, of a younger man called Alfred Vail, who very importantly had money. And it was Vail 
uh, that enabled the a lot of the financing of the work to go ahead. And it was also, Morse's original system did not involve what we now think of as Morse code or a key. He was trying to make, you know, essentially a mechanical system where you printed out your message on paper tape and dropped it through a machine and it all got printed at the other end. Um, and it was only when he started working with Vail that they simplified it back to the key that we saw on the, uh, uh, on the first or second slide. Um, they eventually managed to lay uh, a 40-mile, I think it was, cable, alongside the metals of, uh, this, in this case, I think it was the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, um, who, who did pretty much the same thing as the GWR, uh, because they made them sign an agreement that said, one, if this is, if this is an embarrassing failure, you're not to, um, you, you know, uh, you're not to besmirch the reputation of the railway in any way. And two, if it works, can we have, it, can we have free traffic on it for railway business, please? Um, so the, famously, the first message sent along, uh, along this uh, was, what hath God wrought? Uh, things went downhill quite a lot after that. Um, I'm, as I'm going to mention later, the, very, the second message sent was, have you any news? <laughs> But, uh, anyway, um, adoption of the telegraph by the public was initially quite slow because people didn't quite understand what they could use it for. Uh, in fact, the British telegraph probably took off slightly quicker following the birth of, because the, the news of the birth of Queen Victoria's second child uh, was rushed to, which of course was at Windsor, just outside Slough, <laughs> and so was rushed to London by the electric telegraph, um, and immediately a celebratory dinner, uh, so appeared in the papers in London very quickly, as a celebratory dinner was organised for that evening or the day after at the castle. The Duke of Wellington was one of the attendees and forgot his formal dress coat, and so had to telegraph back to ask it to be sent along. And there was also a widely publicised case on, of a man who murdered his mistress in Slough, tried to escape on the train to London, um, but his description was sent over the telegraph and he was nabbed on arrival at Paddington. Um, but once people had started getting the idea of what you could use it for, um, the telegraph networks started expanding slowly, but then with increasing rapidity. Um, and the first problem you get is wanting to start connecting to other countries, which, if you're an island, like we are in now, presents the problem of getting over the sea. Now, this fella is called John Brett. He was another enthusiastic entrepreneur who didn't really know much about the physics of telegraphs or anything like that, but nonetheless managed to produce, um, on the second attempt, um, a cross-channel, a working cross-channel cable. His first attempt was in 1850, which was quite a, quite a small wire encased in gutta percha. Has anybody heard of gutta percha? It's, um, it, it's a sort of rubbery resin from something called a gutta percha tree. Um, which is um, soft and malleable when hot, but solid when cold. And the Victorians basically used it as a kind of plastic. Um, his second attempt, where the wire was a lot thicker and it was encased in a lot more gutta percha, was successful. Um, and the directors of the gutta percha company were delighted to discover that this was going to be the standard way of laying... Of designing international cables in the Victorian era, and they sold a hell of a lot of gutta percha <laughs> as a result. So, we've got over the channel by 1850, 1851. There are cables to Ireland and Belgium and the Netherlands by 1853. And the next big thing, of course, is going to be, can we bridge the Atlantic? Now, People were very aware of the problems that the cross-channel cable had had. Um, the signal was very indistinct. Due the put, submerging wire in seawater changes the uh, transmission characteristics of it in ways that were not fully understood 
at the time. Uh, the, and so the first cross-channel cable, they discovered that essentially the signals lost all their definition and you could only get stuff down very slowly. So essentially all the people in the know thought that you know, people who knew about telegraphs reckoned that bridging the Atlantic was going to be next to impossible. So obviously what you needed was an enthusiast with no knowledge of telegraphy and a shitload of money. Enter American Cyrus Field, who had made an absolute wodge out of a paper business and retired at the age of 33, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he was the absolute perfect person uh, to do it. And he, uh, so he engaged, he talked to both the British and the US governments and persuaded them each that they would help construct the cable. So the first attempt at a transatlantic cable was in 1858, yet more gutter percher. It was laid jointly there was no ship at the time that could hold enough cable to cross the Atlantic. So it was laid jointly by HMS Agamemnon and the USS Niagara, who met in the middle of the Atlantic. It took them a few goes to work out this attempt, work out this way of doing it, but they met in the middle of the Atlantic, joined their cables together, and then steamed for their respective shores. Okay. Um, it took them four goes but they did eventually manage to get the cable going. Then there was a huge hoo-ha about this. This was really, really big news. There were celebratory dinners and God knows what else. Uh, you know, public ticker tape parades and what... You no, know, it wouldn't have been ticker tape, because that's after, but fireworks and all that sort of thing. And unfortunately, it didn't work very well. Um, Queen Victoria's message to President Buchanan apparently took 16 hours before they could manage to get the whole message through. And the cable failed completely um, in under a month. So why did the cable fail? Well, it's an interesting question. Again, there are two important figures uh, behind this. Uh, Field had engaged this person, uh, Edward Whitehouse, as his technical bod. Now, Whitehouse was actually a surgeon. Okay. He had very little scientific experience, no telegraph experience whatsoever, and conducted his own experiments. This was actually one of the reasons that Field liked him, because, you know, he, he only trusted his own experiments and wasn't one for theory, and that appealed to Field. Okay. Now, as it happens, on the, um, on the later voyages... White House couldn't go, and he got somebody else to go as the sort of technical person in his stead. And that was this fellow, uh, William Thompson, who is better known to history as Lord Kelvin. Now, Kel you know, Thompson was a very serious scientist, and he profoundly disagreed with White House's design of the cable. White House had decided that it was pointless having more than a very, very small core in your cable uh, and the thing to do was to put a high voltage down it now of, the, of course that meant that um, <clears throat> that meant you had to push quite hard to get a signal through and that meant you buggered the insulation pretty quickly and that's, and that's, why, that's going to be why it stopped working um, it wasn't directly out of the failure of this cable, but there was also an attempt to lay, a British attempt to lay a cable on the Red Sea, which was financed from public money, and so there had to be an inquiry when that didn't work. And Thompson gave evidence that that inquiry, as did Wheatstone, um, and essentially White House's reputation was completely trashed, and he never recovered. Um, and... Thompson was greatly involved in the later successful uh, attempt to lay a transatlantic cable, which was still being um, pushed by field, but I'll come to that in a moment. Because in the meantime, we had a Suez to India cable laid in 1859, but it had failed by 1860 and was replaced in 1864 by a mostly overland route. Um, 
The US transcontinental cable was completed in 1861. Now, this is a very interesting picture, because this is an engraving of the Pony Express in operation. Does anybody know how long the Pony Express lasted for? Well, it was, I looked it up today. It was in operation for 18 months. And that's the reason. Because they set up the Pony Express and some buggers came along, put up a load of poles with a wire across the top, and the whole thing was pointless fairly, <laughs> fairly soon after. So, US transcontinental cable completed 1861, and way hey, 1869, we have the technology to have a better go at a transatlantic cable. This is the Great Eastern. Brunel's Leviathan uh, of a ship, which had been, through a variety of circumstances, something of a commercial failure, to put it mildly, but was absolutely perfect for cable laying because it was huge, and you could stick an Atlantic's worth of cable in it. So the, the first go they made was 1865. They got two-thirds of the way over with the Thomson design cable. They got two-thirds of the way over, and then the cable snapped at a point where it was two miles deep. They tried to recover it, but they didn't quite have the right gear on board to do it, so they had to return to Ireland. The next year, they tried again. This time, they went from Ireland over to Newfoundland completely successfully. The Great Eastern then went back to where it had dropped the cable, where it had lost the previous cable, successfully grappled it, and the next year completed that cable. So by 18, 1866, the Transatlantic Cable Company had not one but two cables in operation. The first complete cable, the revenue from that on its first day of operation was £1,000, um, which is a humongous amount of money. <laughs> and in fact, Cyrus Field um, paid off all the debts of the operation by the end of 1867. That was how much money this thing made. It was seriously profitable. So, anyway, by this stage, you know, we're pretty much at the point where we have, you know, a global network. And fast forward today, where we live in the world of the internet, and it's magic, and it's like nothing that's ever come before. And it's brought with it a whole load of entirely new consequences, which are less than desirable. Well, interestingly, the first spam that anyone's been able to locate in the public record is from 1864. And the reason we know about it is because what happened was the London Telegraph Company did a special offer one weekend, 100 messages for £10. And this was shortly after the start of the publication of, of a very useful book. If you want to spam people, what's better than a copy of Who's Who, which even includes their addresses? And the reason we know about this is because one absolutely outraged user, a recipient of a spam telegram, exact, reacted exactly like his modern-day equivalents. He went and whinged about it on social media. Uh, which in the context of uh, the 1860s meant he wrote a letter to the Times, which helpfully included the entire spam message as well, because, you know, that's what you did. Um, here's Napoleonic era, you know, Nigerian 419 spam. Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, th this is a real um, Spanish prisoner letter. Uh, you would get you would receive a letter in the mail from someone. It's a letter-based con, advance free fraud. In the particularly popular in the Peninsular War, but it goes back sort of further than that. It's essentially I'm stuck. You know, I'm a prisoner of war. I'm stuck in jail in Spain, and I need a certain amount of money to get out. But when I get out, I know where a shed load of gold is buried, and I'll cut you in on the proceeds. Wow, that's good. Now, but, and what about, you know, sort of other criminal uses of networks, you know, things like financial fraud? Well, let's go back to Claude Sharp's network. Uh, 
Uh, Claude Chapin, poor lad. This is a statue of him that used to stand in the Boulevard Raspail in Paris. This picture was taken in the 30s. Um, and his network, he, he unfortunately was struggled a bit with his mental health and it, it ended up killing himself by throwing himself down a well. Anyway, 1834. Uh, there are two brothers who are bankers in Bordeaux, Joseph and Francois Blanc, and they traded government bonds. Now, the thing about the French network, it was government only. No other traffic was allowed to go over it because it was so sensationally expensive. So the price of government bonds came by, to Bordeaux by mail coach. Okay, it, it took three days to reach Bordeaux from Paris. I've said the telegraph network was government only, and so it was. So what these brothers did was they found one of the telegraph operators in Tours, which is still 350k north of Bordeaux, and they bribed him to insert indications of movements in the Paris bond market into messages they were sending because the SHAP system had a backspace. So what they would do was send a code indicating the movement of the Paris market, immediately followed by a backspace, so, so it just looked like an accident. And the brothers, so the, the official message that reached the end had absolutely no sign of this. Uh, but the brothers also hired somebody with knowledge of the semaphore uh, to sit on a hill outside Bordeaux with a telescope trained on the nearby <laughs> tower. Um, and they made a mint, and they only came unstuck in 1836 when the operator in tour got ill and asked one of his colleagues to fill in for him, and the colleague instead shot them. Um, so they got, they got arrested and hauled before the beak, and um, guess what? There was no law against it. <laughs> they got off, and um, in fact, um, Joseph Blanc uh, ended up running the casino in Monte Carlo uh, instead. Does anybody remember the great, Philip, great Prince Philip Prestel mailbox hack? That's the one, um, where the perpetrators um, eventually had to be um, charged with theft of electricity because that was the only thing on the statute book. Um, another thing about networks we have these days, we have codes and ciphers and compression. Well, you had exactly the same thing then. Um, telegrams were, it could be, ex horrendously expensive. Um, 330 words on the overland telegraph from Adelaide to Darwin uh, would cost three weeks' average wages. To send. So it's important to keep the number of words down as small as possible. And there were widespread use of codes, published code books, indeed. This is one of them, and this is the full message that it's encoding slash compressing in there. I think it's really quite impressive. Now, of course, when people started sending messages that you couldn't read, what's the first thing that happens? Governments try to ban them. And in fact, to some extent, the, the, um, the telegraph companies didn't like this either. And for a long time, there was a running battle. Um, the telegraph companies uh, at least wanted to be able to charge more for cipher code because that was more fiddly for their operators to send. Um, and there's an interesting paper from 1926 uh, written by this guy, who's uh, William F. Friedman and his wife Elizabeth. Friedman was, the, um, in many ways, the U.S.'s top, top, cryptog top cryptographer. It was a team working for Friedman uh, that broke the Japanese purple code uh, in the late 1930s. The interesting thing, though, also, is his wife Elizabeth was also a shit-hop cryptographer um, as well. And they were quite a team. I think. Uh, one of the reasons, incidentally, purple was weak was that it treated vowels differently to consonants because that helped keep the costs down when you were telegraphing things. <sighs> Did you know Britain had its own worldwide telegraph network that was reserved for all British traffic <laughs> so that nobody else could sniff it? Um, do you also know that Britain's first hostile act on the outbreak of hostilities in World War I was to cut the, German cut the German overseas cables so that all German overseas traffic had to go via wireless? We were also very, very naughty and intercepted US diplomatic traffic at Porthcurno. Uh, 
which is how the British government learned about the Zimmermann telegram, which was the attempt by Germany to drag Mexico into the war uh, against the US. Going back to, to modern internet, the first thing you had to do in a telegram was say who the recipient was, which meant putting a name and an address in there, and that's more words, damn it. So there was a system. You could register a telegraphic address. This is the old Moreland Brewery Company in Abingdon. This was for an Abingdon, uh, Oxford audience, OK. Um, you could register a word with the post office in London. You paid a small annual fee for it, and then you could just use that word as the address. Does that not sound like the DNS system to you? Totally. And just like the DNS systems today, there were entire organizations that ended up naming themselves after their address. The, probably the best known one, especially if you're in Oxford, is Oxfam. That's where it came from. Newspapers. Now, newspapers were initially very, very fearful about the Telegraph because what they thought was that the Telegraph would supply all news and they'd go out of business. In fact, it didn't work out like that because uh, the, the newspapers discovered that actually they could get more up-to-date information. They could publish four editions a day with updated news in it and some people would buy all four editions. Um, it also created the, um, the newswire industry. Uh, Paul Julius Reuter moved from Antwerp to London uh, to, because he had a, uh, a foreign correspondence network operating for largely for commercial city prices at the time, uh, but moved to London because it was the centre of the um, uh, centre of the telegraph world in Europe at the time. And as a little aside, on the subject of newspapers, this is a lovely little snippet I picked up somewhere. Where did newspapers get their names from? Well, look at these stagecoach names. These are stagecoaches leaving London in 1836. You know, the Telegraph goes to Bishop Stortford and the Economist to Birmingham and the Times to Brighton. And my absolute favourite one is the Morning Star went to Tunbridge Wells, <laughs> which is quite sensational. In the business, in the business of the Telegraph, the big thing for the Telegraph operators was how fast your operators could send and receive messages. And it, it became very quickly a very meritocratic business. They didn't care who you were or what you did. What was important was how, far you could, how fast you could send code. And actually, it was also an occupation in which many women took part. Um, because... You know, if you're in a, if, if all you care about is how fast you can send and receive code, well, you know, you know how it is. Once you take away the, um, once you take away the social barriers, it turns out women are better at it than men are, as always. Um, it was also a place where <clears throat> the other thing you needed in the telegraph system was somebody to do the final stage of delivery. Um, for which they typically used messenger boys. Uh, that's how Thomas Edison and Andrew Carnegie started their careers, as telegraph messenger boys. Uh, Edison went on to become a telegraph operator himself and even proposed, even taught his, his, the lady he wanted to be his second wife, Morse code, so he could propose to her online. On which subject you might think that romance online is a new thing. No, it isn't. <laughs> there were several cases of weddings conducted over the telegraph as early as sort of 1870 or so. And here's an entire novel about falling in love over a Morse code line. Um, it's one of the... It's obviously something that was restricted to the operators. The great thing about the internet is we can all be operators of it. But nevertheless, it's a microcosm of what's to come. Another interesting microcosm of what's to come is, do you remember when the internet first appeared and everyone was, oh my God, this is going to bring peace and love to the world? This is Nicholas Negroponte, director of the MIT lab in 1997. The children of the future are not going to know what nationalism is. And here's Cyrus Field's brother Henry, 100 years previously, the telegraph brings the world together. It joins the sundered hemisphere as it unites distant nations, making them feel they're members of one great family. Yeah, 
right. <laughs> and close to finally, here's a map of the, the international telegraph system at its height. Look at, you can see, I mean, it's got the cables of one particular company marked in red, but they've got all the other cable routes marked as well. <clears throat> Here's what the undersea cable that powers the internet looks like. 99.9% .9 of internet traffic goes over an undersea cable somewhere. Um, we're doing the same thing. We're just doing it um, quite a lot more fancifully. And there was just one thing I was going to appall you with at the end of this. I'm going to go back to Charles Wheatstone. Because um, one of the other things he did, he, his father, um, sorry, he, he started life being apprenticed to his uncle's musical instrument business. Uh, Wheatstone was absolutely terrible at it. He, he was fascinated by the physics of sound, but didn't give a shit about business or the work of making instruments. Um, instead, he, did, he designed one. This is Charles Wheatstone's invention. This is an English concertina. Uh, the concertina was invented all, uh, very closely, simultaneously, in England and Germany. Wheatstone, this is an English concertina, and Wheatstone was the inventor of it. And in fact, the Wheatstone Company, which was originally his uncle's company, um, was the preeminent manufacturer of English concertinas. This one's from 1910. Um, it's actually made by a firm called Lacanal, but they started as, Lacanal started as a subcontractor for Wheatstone. So, if ever you are unfortunate... Whoa. If you're ever unfortunate enough to see me with bells on, I might have this in hand. You have to be warned. <laughs> right. Uh, race to the end of it. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>